Welcome back. So this week we also had guests in Accra and ECOWAS leaders uh, have been in the country trying to work on the delicate political and security situation in Guinea, Mali, Burkina Faso and Equatorial Guinea. We know that coups have been holding in all these countries except Equatorial Guinea and uh, ECOWAS has agreed to send a military force there to maintain political uh, peace and uh, stability as well. But the question is, are these the ways to tackle all these issues and how do we prevent what President Akufuado um, described as the contagious nature of coup d'etats in the West African sub-region? Let me start first with Dr. Asa Asante. Um, so Dr. Asa Asante, do we potentially expect to see more coups in the West African sub-region? Because three is a lot. One failed, but there's no guarantee that they won't try again, which is why I guess ECOWAS agreed to, in their communique issued on Thursday that they will send uh, troops there. For me, as a student of politics, I don't want to see an echo. But situations can bring trouble to us. Why am I saying that? Today we are seeing a lot of, you know, military uh, taking over the reins of government, and then they are ruling in West Africa. That was the situation in the 1960s, 1970s, and 1980s. Let me just walk us through a few of the statistics. If you look at the sub-region, that is uh, West Africa, the sub-regions I want to look, West Africa from 1960 to 1969, we had 19 coups. Uh, Central Africa, eight coups. Eastern Africa, 10 coups. Southern Africa, zero. So all totaling 37 coups within this uh, blocks. Then between 1970 and 79, we had West Africa 49 coups, uh, 14 for Central Africa, 26 for Eastern Africa, and then 10 for Southern Africa. All put together 99 coups in the what between 1970 and 1979. Then 1980 and beyond. We have West Africa, 36 coups plus recent four. Then you have what, Central Africa, 13, Eastern Africa, 12, um, Southern Africa, six, all put together over 70. It tells you that for coups, what it tells is that anytime there's a coup, people learn from that and replicate. And it's based on a number of factors. More often than not, when you look at it, they have virtually the same uh, charge that they level against uh, constitutional government. Either corruption, nepotism, security matters, favoritism, and all that. If you look at what we have, let's look at even the three countries, Chad, uh, four, Chad, Mali, Guinea, Burkina Faso. You have Chad, issue of third term agenda was there, where people, uh, you know, change constitution, and then they prolong the constitutionally mandated what tenure to what three terms. All right. If you go to Mali, issue of corruption was then nepotism security. If you go to Guinea, you have what uh, eroding norms of democracy. All right. Then you have what third term agenda, economic mismanagement. You go to Burkina Faso, corruption, nepotism. You know all there is that uh, you you can enumerate. We have them. So when you have these things, then you give the opportunity for soldiers to come and take over. Soldiers always operate along certain theories. We have one called the civilian regime performance. Soldiers' argument is that if you study uh, military politics, they say that, look, uh, they are the only institutions armed with authority to right the wrongs of civilian administration. So when evils like what, corruption, nepotism, and co, uh, rear their ugly heads in democracy, they have the magic one to come and turn things around. But we have seen time and again that it's not true. They only use that as a, you know, a precursor to come and do other things. And then they also create a theory of what they call what the, um, the, the group identification theory, where they believe that there are certain things that should just need to have, their training and all that. So when they are exposed to training in Mons, Sanghat, you know, and Imperial College and all that, when they come back, they expect government to live up to a certain level. If government is not able to do, then they take over administration of okay. government. But, but the when you look at all this, yeah. you realize that it's playing out. 
But will, we, will we potentially see more? Because the issues you mentioned, like corruption, economic challenges, yes. I think it's, it's widespread in a lot of the West African yes. countries. That is why we are vulnerable. You had a president that is contagious, all right? If you don't stop it, then you are emboldening people to come in and then foment trouble for us. Okay. Uh, but what we are seeing, you know, one of it has been the fact that ECOWAS has been what, dull. They have not been able to live, uh, lift their game. We have been here where some ECOWAS leaders have changed constitutions for a third term and nothing has been said to them. Then you strengthen the hand of others to also follow suit and then we are in trouble. If you look at even the uh, ECOWAS protocol on elections, where they talk about, you know, tenure of office. I recently I appeared before the, I uh, presented a paper at the ECOWAS Parliament, and I said that they need to take a second look at that provision, where if you want to give two tenure, you should not water down the two tenure, where, so I suggested that you can limit it to between three and five years, so that if you have two tenure of, say, maximum of five, it's ten, then water down and having about six years, two times and so forth and so on. Okay. These are let some me, of the things when okay. we look let at it. Let me put a pause on you there and bring in uh, Honorable Akuja to Ablakwa because you've raised something quite important about the protocols on election. Now, there's a question also about the requirements ECOWAS places on some of the countries that have been caught up in coups. For instance, they are asking for timetable within six months. They are asking for timetable within a year. Meanwhile, these are countries that are suffering from uh, threats of Islamic extremism or even have Islamic ex extremists in their country. They have economic challenges. And of course, they have very little or very poor political structures. Shouldn't ECOWAS look again at these requirements that it puts? And then when the coup leaders say, well, we can't meet your six months, wait for five years then they suspend them. You, you have a point there. I mean, this week I read a statement in Parliament um, really urging colleagues in our own republic to be conscious of the development in the sub-region, not to be complacent and to take steps to uh, prevent this from, from occurring. Because as has been widely acknowledged, coups are very contagious. And when they start, a domino effect sets in. And it leads to the copycat effect where militaries in the sub-region decide to um, uh, replicate what their colleagues have done. Let's recall that the first coup in the sub-region was in 1963 in Togo. And immediately, it really uh, emboldened elements in Ghana to stage the 24 February 1966 coup. And it followed that same year, Nigeria. And then we, we've seen that it's become a culture. Um, since the 1960s to the 1990s, Doc is right. You've had an average of... 25 coups a decade, if you look at the data, in the West Africa subregion. So we have that dubious reputation of being the coup region. And it is the reason why what is happening now must concern all of us. Because in the 1990s, there was a certain refreshing wave of democratization. And since then, the notion appear to be crystallizing that we've put the coup era behind us. This is the first time in 23 years, the last time we saw four coups happen in a year was in 1999, 23 years ago. It's never happened that in one year, as we saw in 2021, two coups in Mali, we saw the coup in Guinea, and then in Sudan. It's not happened in 23 years. And it is no wonder the UN Secretary General has has, has warned the world that there is now an epidemic of coups in Africa. That's how he calls it, an epidemic of coups. So we need to see a different strategy. What is even complicating matters is the geopolitics. If you have followed keenly what is happening in French West Africa, you see other external forces at play. I was surprised that at the UN Security Council, meeting on the 12th of January. 
Russia and China boldly and publicly blocked the statement that France and the U.S. has sponsored, which was to endorse the ECOWAS sanctions on Mali. So as we speak, only the African Union has endorsed ECOWAS's sanctions. The United Nations has not been able to endorse it. Which tells you that this is a very complex situation. You have Mali expelling the French ambassador. And as we speak, there are millions on the streets in Mali and other French West Africa countries saying that France should just leave. They should cut all the colonial ties. And you have the Wagner group from Russia training this, you know, military um, junta. The, 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 the new coup leaders appear more comfortable with what Russia and China is offering to deal with their insurgencies. So it's a very, 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 very complicated matter with geopolitics at play. And I think that ECOWAS will have to change strategy. This same old template, when it happens, you condemn sanctions and then you give a strict timetable return and you are spot on. I also belong to the school of thought that says that ECOWAS must be preemptive and preventive in its approach. Look, the Africa Center for Strategic Studies says that from 2015 to now, 13 African countries have changed their constitutions, have watered down term limits. Either they have allowed the third term or removing the, the, the limits, or rewriting the constitution, and then they say that we are now starting afresh, like we are seeing in Togo. He has said if there will be a new constitution, his, the, the, all the years he's done must not count. He's now going to have his first term. We've seen what has happened in Ivory Coast. 13 African countries, according to the African Center for Strategic Studies. And what does ECOWAS do? What does AU do? We don't see sanctions. We don't see the high-handedness that they bring to bear when a coup happens. So instead of waiting for coups to happen, ECOWAS must now be asking itself, in between elections, and you see, look, if you read the international literature, they are all converging that democracy is sick all around the world, even in the advanced democracy, United States of America. Look at the insurrection that happened. In Britain, they are surprised that uh, David Boris is still at post. You are seeing the ultra-nationalists taking over, you know, in, 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 in other parts of Europe. But in Africa, democracy is, 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 is comatose. Our situation is even more severe. We are not seeing the democratic dividend. You are seeing high unemployment. You are seeing failed states. These violent extremists are taking over. By the time the coup happened in Mali, the government was not in control of about half of the territory. By the time the coup happened in Burkina Faso, the government had lost control. More than half of the country had been taken over by the terrorists. Actually, what triggered the coup was the massacre of about 50 soldiers at the Suwum province in, in Burkina Faso. So, and when the soldiers went to see the president to intervene, he said that the, uh, he lacked resources. You know, so the, 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 the situation is dire. And we must now be asking ECOWAS that, look, be preventive, be preemptive. In between elections, it's not just enough that there is frequent elections, the elections are taking place. In between the elections, what happens? Ensure that... Are should, you checking? Because... They, do they have the structures to ensure that people are doing the right thing in between elections? They do. You remember that? Remember, remember that some time ago, it was President Tabo Mbeki who initiated the idea of the peer review, mm. the NEPAD initiative, mm -hmm. where African presidents, because at the time, the African Union was being nicknamed the Club of Dictators, and, you know, human rights, democratic credentials, you know, rule of law, did not matter. That peer review was to allow for them to have frank discussions. In my statement in Parliament this week, I proposed that ECOWAS should have independent CSOs of African origin assess independent every country in between elections. We have the Mo, Mo Ibrahim Foundation, for yes. example, that does the Ibrahim Index on good governance. You can pay attention to that data, commission them, so that in between, 
because you are having a lot of failed states. They may be conducting elections, all right, but the democratic dividend is not there. They are closing the democratic space. They are imprisoning political opponents. Uh, they are not paying attention to security. They are not paying attention to job creation. There's economic mismanagement. And you think that just because elections are going on, you know, the, so they the, need to put so a structure in place. Put the structures in place that allow for some peer review, where you have frank discussions. What so, what should ECOWAS do when constitutions are tampered with? Sanctions must apply. So be, be preemptive. Then there is also the matter of the ECOWAS standby force. Okay, Look, let me hold you there. Yeah. We'll come to that. Let me take okay. uh, because that will be the last okay. word. So Honorable Pemka, uh, uh, the President Anakufuado has a lot of work to do it seems and he's been having these meetings rather frequently it's a herculean task you know my i associate with most of the comments by the, the, my co-panelist but you see what is the motivation for these schools he spoke about the behavior of the un security council the general assembly and etc towards us what is the reason why we should not have unanimity in handling the issues at that level so that we condemn these and we get the people to hand over as soon as possible? What is the reason? What is the motivation? Look at Burkina. He spoke about it. In fact, in Burkina, more than seven, more, about 70% of the country is occupied by insurgents. And that poses a threat to your region, of your course. home region, yeah. the Upper yes. East region. Yeah. About 70% is occupied by insurgents. The rest of the 30%, eh, the majority of the 30%, French troops are there. And you know why they're there? They are guiding mines. Some mines that are dotted in Burkina. They are guided so that they can exploit their essentially, resources. Essentially resources or infrastructure that are important to, French, to that, France. That, that, that is the point. That is why, as he rightly mentioned, Honorable Okujeta Blackwam rightly mentioned, in some of those other countries, in, in, in Mali and other places, they have virtually declared the French persona non grata yeah. in those countries. Yeah. Virtually. Yeah. And it is because of their exploitative nature. They are not there to enhance and deepen democracy. They are just there to exploit the resources, create more confusion and divisions in the country, and get their resources to go back. Look, but, but, I stated but, but, this but, time and again, eh, uh, I know yeah. you may be aware of that because yeah. of your international exposure on some of this. Look at DR Congo, for example. Yeah. They have resources. The, the mineral deposits in DR Congo is more than the U.S. economy. Yeah. The entire U.S. economy. It's the richest nation in the world. Yes! You can take care of the whole world. Okay. So, so what, world. What, what, yeah. what would you want what, to what? see done? For instance, the proposal on the troops. Is that a good way to go? Because me, the I impression think that, I have I is... think that it's long overdue to have a standing uh, troops. But... Even if we have the standing troops, we have to also do... I totally agree. I think I, I once upon a time answered a question on this when I went for my law interview. NEPAD and peer review. I totally agree that we should re-strengthen it. That idea was a very good one. You, you, you assessed yourself. They, they will meet at the, the forum and then peer review themselves. And then there will be a critique. Somebody would study your system and come and give a critique. For example, in our system, there was previously a critique on allowing for the, for the, the minister, minister for of parliamentary, parliamentary affairs, affairs to, at the same time, be uh, a majority, a majority leader. leader. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when they were doing the peer review, they yeah. actually criticized yeah. that aspect. And I believe that along the line it was taken, taken out and all that. So if you look at the system as it is now, we've already spoken about the fact that it's becoming... A, a, a contagious and infectious disease but do, do, you, do, you, do you worry that there will be more coups? I, I worry that um, if, if care is not taken, people will take advantage in other countries mm -hmm. to replicate what is going on. You realize that uh, I think it was Guinea-Bissau just three or four days ago. Yes, yeah. they were able to foil it. Mm. And they said they made some arrest and all that. Mm. We, are not, we are not going to be told how human rights will be abused in the name of trying to, to kill these uh, mutinous uh, soldiers and all that. I think that the over-excitement by the soldiers to also get into the, the, the fall and seize power is becoming too much. If they remain professional within the... And, 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 and we, we put politicians on their toes. That's why I like my, my country, Ghana. We, we like join. We join join to solve our problems. And that is very good for us. We need a vibrant opposition. There is nothing wrong with having a vibrant opposition. 
it will keep government on its toes. And we should also have compromises in the name of national cohesion. After all, we have only one nation. And if we destroy it, we will not have any other. So if we, 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 we try to consolidate our gains, for me, I am not a magician. But I can tell you for sure that there cannot be any coup in Ghana. All right, I'll end that on that one, point. So I can say one minute that for Ghanaians, you, uh, as we are, we are not ready for any such. And okay. the circumstances for it do not exist, and we we'll never have seen in All the All right, country. one minute for you, Dr. Sasante, to yes. wrap up. You can pick it back from what uh, Honorable Penka said, and your quick comments on whether we need the standby force. Um, in, yeah, in we, we hope and pray that our leaders will do the need for because, you see, people go for democracy so that democracy will yield certain dividend that will rob off them. If they don't get it, that is where we have democratic reversals. Then you have what? Such evils rearing their ugly heads. We saw that in Latin America, Europe, and all that. So all that we are saying is that for you to prevent coups, you need to govern well. Be mindful of people's what, rights and freedoms. Uh, build a solid economy for them to make a living. And then you discourage the third term agenda so that whoever engages in that, there are sanctions, serious ones for those people. And then we continue to educate the electorate that your right is in your own hands. When you get the opportunity to change a government, don't go for what? Hampers, uh, money, and so forth and so on. You remove a government which is incompetent, which is insensitive, which cannot provide for you easily. And then I also believe that, look, if the thing is getting difficult for us, why can't you call for a center help? We can, you know, when we want to sanction, we can invite uh, those uh, Western powers and then Western institutions to come in. Because in the 90s, you realize that uh, and most Western powers and institutions, you mean who? Because I'm talking about the IMF. What? tells us that China and Russia pushed back in the other I understand way. that. But ha if you talk to IMF World Bank, it can be what? A part of what? Conditions for facility. You remember in the 90s, that was a condition. Go and democratize. Otherwise, you are not going to have funding. That's why the third wave will stabilize and we will have what? Democracy. Because some people will always argue that, oh, we are independent state. Uh, we have come this far. So why are you going to sell your sovereignty? We have already sold our sovereignty. We go for hampers. We go for loans to build our state, even road construction and all that, we seek their support. So when you are in difficulty and it's going to even affect the money that they have in, uh, you know, invested in the countries, why can't you go and seek support? So I believe that when we are able to walk this path, then soldiers will not get the appetite to come and what? Deceive people into believing that they have the magic wand and they can turn things around. Countries that soldiers have led, I tell you, they will do a few things just to please you. But when you want to get them off power, it becomes what? A difficult task. All right, final point to you, Honorable Ablakwa. Let's learn useful lessons from how all these schools are being celebrated. The thousands who throng the streets and jubilate. It's a lesson. In Burkina Faso, he was Mali. a de democratically elected leader. But look at the support, the popular support. Mali, Guinea. So let's not live in a fool's paradise. The democratic dividend must be brought to bear. We must address the issue of mass unemployment, despondency, disillusionment, breakdown in, in public institutions, social amenities, lack of opportunities, no industrialization, the contempt of the, and arrogance of the ruling elite. When people see that there's a disconnect, you are living in a world of your own, intransigence refusing to listen when the people say that, look, we don't like this policy. And then leaders who say that they want everybody to bed in share, but the ruling elites will then arrogate to themselves everything, all the resources. Those are the precipitating factors. Those are the causative factors. Look, those who stage coups, when the ground is not fertile when they know that they will be resisted. Because look, there is no army in this world that can overthrow the people, that can override the people. It's, it's not possible. We, from, we saw what happened in, in, in China, the Tiananmen Square. We, we've seen how in, in Sudan, the people rose up and they toppled 
powerful man, Al Bashir. We have seen how militaries have crumbled. In Turkey, when they tried the coup and the people didn't support it, they said, no, Erdogan must return and be our leader. They toppled the coup. So government should just do what the people want. And that is your best protection. And the people themselves the will people protect The people themselves will democracy. protect the democracy and they will resist any attempt to undermine democracy. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Mm -hmm. I want to say thanks to you all. Honorable Kujetua Blackwa, Dr. Asa Asante, Honorable Joseph Pemka. Many thanks. It's been a hot uh, three hours here. And uh, that's key points for us for today on 3FM 92.7 and on TV3. I'm Jifa Bampo. Many thanks to the entire production team and to all of you who sent us messages via Twitter and WhatsApp. My name is Jifa Bampo. Join us again next week for another interesting edition. Up next, of course, is Warm Up Plus for those of you interested in sports.